Well, I want us to go to Second Corinthians chapter three this evening. If you know anything about the book of Second Corinthians, it follows first. <laughs> but you know, First Corinthians is a book in which really Paul nails that church, right? He nails them because they are messed up. Just reminds me of Bethel. We're all the same. We all have our problems. And they were no different. And it was a it was a messed up city. It was a terrible, uh, it was a a port city. You know what goes on at the beach, beach towns, right? You know, uh, the lifestyle that they lived. And so it was a it was a a wicked place. And that's what these people were saved out of. And they still had thing baggage that they had to deal with, just like we all do. Well, Paul went there and uh, he was uh, preparing to go again. But he writes Second Corinthians to them to continue to deal with the, some needs that they had, uh, some problems, but also to defend his apostleship because he was being attacked by some there that he he didn't matter. He wasn't, uh, he didn't have authority over us. And so he's defending his ministry and his apostleship. In chapter three, he's talking about his ministry. Look at how he begins it. He says, look, do I have to write, do I have to get a letter of recommendation in order for you to think that I have authority to minister to you? He said, you want a letter of recommendation? Look at yourselves. You're the only letter I need. It's because of my ministry among you that you're believers. And uh, so that's how he begins. Paul's very sarcastic. Have you noticed that at times? He gets very sarcastic. Uh, it's very helpful, too, the way that he does it. But um, I, wanna, I want to actually pick up in, in uh, the fourth verse and the rest of the chapter. I'm not going to read it. But what it is about is he is contrasting the glory, the superior glory of the new covenant that we as new covenant believers have versus the old covenant that the people that followed Moses had. So we'll be looking at that in a moment. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for bringing us together tonight. It's just, again, such a wonderful reprieve to be out of uh, just a worldly environment and to be together with our Bibles, uh, knowing that we're going to share your word together. We're going to talk about you and your wonderful works. And we're going to pray for one another because we're needy and we need you to work and intervene. And so thank you for this time tonight. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll make this a very profitable uh, portion of scripture to our hearts. Make it practical in our lives, we pray. And we just thank you for what you're going to do as we depend upon you, Holy Spirit, to make your word live in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You remember The Price is Right and Bob Barker? Remember that? Some of you older people do. They used to have this, uh, this uh, program, and they'd give stuff away, right? And they would have, uh, you'd have to, at one point, they have three doors or three curtains, three curtains. And you could choose what's behind curtain number one, curtain number two, or curtain number three. I mean, if you chose uh, one curtain, it'd go up and maybe you get a, a year's supply of laundry detergent or whatever, you know. But if you chose that other curtain, when they revealed it was a brand new car or whatever, you know, so... You didn't know what was behind either of the curtains because those curtains veiled what was behind it. And people had to make the choice. There is another type of unveiling, a lifting of a curtain. Uh, sometimes when there is a famous artist or a famous sculptor uh, that would be showing publicly their work of art for the first time. The, the people gather in the gallery and there is a dark cloth over that painting, over that sculpture, that, that sculpture. And at the, just uh, with the, the drum roll, uh, the 
veil or the curtain is lifted and the beautiful piece of art is displayed for the first time to the public. Second Corinthians three and the verses that we want to look at tonight, really I'm going to pick up with that verse 12 actually is the removing of a veil. It's the unveiling. There is an unveiling in verses 12 to 18, but the chapter really doesn't end there. It continues in the chapter 4. There's a second unveiling in the first 10 verses of chapter 4, and I want to quickly look at them. The first one, the first unveiling is in 12 to 18 of chapter 3. Here's what he says. Seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, that is their heart, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, we all, with open face, unveiled face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So the first unveiling that I want to bring to your attention in these verses is the unveiling of God's glory in the new covenant. Let me just tell you what the difference is. God made two very different covenants with the nation of Israel. The old covenant, which is the law of Moses, the Torah, and the new covenant, which was ratified by the Lord Jesus' sacrifice on that cross, on that tree. And the contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant in this chapter is the emphasis of the superior glory of the New Covenant over the Old Covenant. And he gives a couple of uh, contrasts. For example, in verse 3 of this chapter, he says that uh, uh, your, our epistle, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, look at this, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. The new covenant is of superior glory than the old covenant, because the old covenant was carved by the finger of God in stone tablets. The new covenant is the spirit of God writing upon the fleshly tables of the human heart. That's superior glory. There's another great uh, contrast in verse 6, where he's talking about being made uh, sufficient for his ministry by the Spirit of God. And he says, uh, who's made us able ministers of the New Testament or the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So you see, the, the, the Lord's glory in the New Covenant is so much greater because the old covenant, the letter of the law, it killed. But the new covenant is the spirit of the law, and it gives life. Just a little bit of a contrast. Now, notice notice what was hidden from Israel in verses 12 to 15 of 2 Corinthians 3. What was hidden from Israel is the glory of the new covenant. Why was that? Well, we we read those verses, and what we discover is that God was judging the nation of Israel because of their stubborn, their willful resistance to God's truth and their rejection of God. Remember the prophet Isaiah? When God uh, commissioned him for his ministry, he said, uh, I'll go. And then God tells him, well, you know what? Your job is going to entail that you're going to go to a people that uh, are deaf and won't hear and are blind and won't see. Uh, You're just really going to be pronouncing my judgment upon them. And uh, Jesus actually quotes that Isaiah 6 passage when he's dealing with a stubborn, willful, resistant, Jewish leaders in John chapter 12. Listen to what he says. 
he said, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see that uh, with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I would heal them. The idea is simply this, that God rendered the nation of Israel to be spiritually blind, incapable of understanding the truth of God's law. He veiled their minds, and it was because they would not believe they came to a point where God said, okay, then you, you will not believe. If you will not, then you cannot believe. They wouldn't, so they couldn't. It came to that point. And so the purpose of covering uh, with a veil is spiritual blindness that was put upon the whole nation of Israel by God because they rejected God's truth. So then perhaps we should ask ourselves, well, if that's the case, if the whole nation of Israel has been spiritually blinded as judgment from God, then how can a Jewish person ever get saved? How can they ever get saved? Well, he answers that in verses 16 to 18. Uh, God has hidden the truth from Israel. He's put a veil, a spiritual blindness over the nation. But that veil can be removed by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we read taking place in verses 16 and 18. He removes that veil. Look at what it says in verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. It, meaning the heart of an individual Jewish person. When an individual turns to the Lord, when a person turns to God, the Holy Spirit rips away the veil. Just remember the curtain of the temple when Jesus died was torn in two from top to bottom? Well, that's the idea. The Holy Spirit tears the veil away from the heart when a person turns to the Lord and God's glory is seen as in Jesus when that veil is removed. And simultaneous to that, what happens is a Jewish person becomes what you would call in a state of completion, becomes a completed Jew. They, have, they undergo an inward conversion. They retain their outward identity as a Jewish person, but they undergo a radical inward change. It's called being born again. And it sets in motion a process of transformation. And that's what he's talking about in the 18th verse. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed. See the word changed in that verse? That change begins the moment a person is born again. And it's a process. And that word changed, we get our English word metamorphosis from it. And that word metamorphosis, or this word change, means to go from one form into an entirely different one, into another new form. Uh, it's a total inward change. It is that now your life shifts from being self-centered to being Christ-centered. You get a new spiritual identity. You become a new creation in Christ. That's exactly what Paul was talking about a couple chapters later. In the fifth chapter, he says, And he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What's he talking about? He's talking about this process of transformation that begins simultaneous with salvation. That now you have a new life centered in Christ, a new spiritual identity. You are a new creature, a new creation. So that's the first veil. 
that uh, is removed, the unveiling of God's glory in the new covenant. But going on into chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, he talks about a second kind of veil that is removed. Look at verse 3. He says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who, the, who is the image of God, should shine in unto them. He says, verse 6, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here is the second veiling. It is in the, the third chapter, God's glory in the new covenant is veiled, but here in chapter four, Jesus's glory in the gospel is veiled. God's glory in the new covenant is hidden, is veiled from the nation of Israel as a judgment from God. And now Jesus's glory is hidden or is veiled from unsaved people by the God of this world, who we know to be Satan. It's hid. The glory of Jesus in the gospel is hidden from the lost. Satan is an unseen uh, spirit. And Satan... He hides the gospel that we share with perishing people behind a veil, behind a covering. Satan blinds the minds of lost people, making it incapable for those people to understand the gospel. You know, the gospel seems pretty simple to us, right? In fact, uh, there's a track periodically on that uh, track rack, and the title is God's Simple Plan of Salvation. Well, it's simple to us, but it's not simple to a lost person. It's hidden to them. Uh, it's, it's veiled to them because of this blindness that comes from the God of this world. They're unable to see the glorious light of the gospel. They're un unable to understand the message about Jesus' glory and that he is the exact image of God and what he's done for us. Well, what has to happen? Well, that veil... That spiritual blindness that hides Jesus' glory in the gospel from them is removed by God. I want you to look uh, at that sixth verse again and notice here's the only solution for spiritual blindness. You know the God that on that uh, in, in the day of creation spoke the sun into existence to shine so that there would be what we know as daylight? Well, that same God, he speaks Jesus' spiritual light to shine in you, to shine in the heart of a lost person. That's what verse 6 says, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. He shines in you. He shines spiritual sunlight into the human heart to reveal the glory of in Jesus, and that belief, when you become a believer, you retain that spiritual sunlight in you. In fact, he says in verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You retain that, that uh, light once you're saved. The greatest treasure of all, Christ lives in you, and he shines through the Fragile clay jars, earthen vessels that we are, where his body, he shines in you. That's how this veil that Satan blinds the mind with is renewed. He shines in you. And then look at this. Pick up in verse 8. Paul talks about what he suffered in ministry. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but not destroyed. Look at verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest or might appear in our body. What's he say? Here's how God removes the veil from the eyes, the mind 
of lost people. He shines in them, but the way that he shines in lost people is through you, is through believers. The way that God penetrates that satanic veil, that spiritually blinded mind, that uh, the, the blind understanding of the lost is through us. But notice it's costly to us. If we're going to shine as lights, if we're going to be the light that God uses to penetrate that satanic darkness in other in the lost uh, people's lives, you know what it, it, it's saying here? He's saying these, these fragile clay jars that he calls them in verse 7, they get jostled about, they get broken, they get cracked, but the reason that they get jostled about and, and broken and cracked is verse 10, so that through us dying, through our breaking, the light shines through. The light is exposed through our lives. The darkness in lost people is penetrated by the breaking of our fragile clay jars, these lives of ours, through suffering, through death to self, and then the light, the light and the life of Jesus can brightly burst forth as a testimony to the lost, which means this. Every time we gripe when we suffer, you veil the gospel. So stop belly aching so that you can shine and so that people can see what God can do in your difficulty through your testimony in the dark. And that's the way that lost people are reached. Even people that persecute believers that actually bring about the breaking of that fragile clay jar. That's how some of them get saved, because they see the light shining through these broken people that they're persecuting. You remember the story in the book of Judges when God raises up Gideon as the judge, the deliverer? Those judges were simply deliverers, okay? And uh, he delivered Israel through Gideon's victory over the Midianites. And they were badly outnumbered. And what God did is he thinned out the forces of Israel. There was like, I think, if I can remember correctly, like 22,000 Midianites. When it was all said and done, God had whittled down the, the Israelite army to 300 men. Against 22,000. And, and God's strategy that he gave, gave Gideon was, okay, divide these, these 300 men in different areas. And on my command, on your command, when you say the sword of the Lord and Gideon, have every one of those 300 guys break the, the lanterns that had the, the light in them break the lantern so the light would would uh, be shown on the mountain side and the enemy would see that and they would think oh wow that's like 300,000 you know uh, soldiers we're up against and that's how god brought panic into the enemy camp and brought victory to the israelites it was through the breaking of those jars those lamps that the light was exposed, and that's what won the victory. It's through the breaking of these fragile clay jars, our bodies, that, that we live in, that God allows the light to shine out to the lost world. I don't believe that, that the loss can be won without God's people paying a cost, without a price being paid, without it being costly without a breaking that needs to happen in our lives. And uh, we're in a very unique situation here in the United States of America. Uh, uh, probably 90% of the world of believers have to suffer bodily uh, suffering for the witness and the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they're having tremendous success in seeing people saved. You realize the fastest growing church uh, is the church in Iran. 
and the church in China. Some of the worst places for persecution is where the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is prospering the most. Why? Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the, of the Lord Jesus, that the life also might be manifest. The light is shining forth from these broken clay jars, these earthen vessels. That's how God's designed it. So God shines in you to lift that darkness, but the way he does it is through broken jars. Our unveiling. When we're unveiled, the light shines forth. And the blindness, that veil that Satan's put on the mind and the understanding, that veil is lifted and they see. 